All right. Uh, so we only have from 11:15 to 12:15. So I'm going to get us started. Uh, I'm Jeff Bachman. I teach human rights courses in the School of International Service. This is my third year here. I also co-direct the MA program in Ethics, Peace, and Global Affairs. Um, I, I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is because. I mean, I do believe in the importance of scholarly activism, um, but I know that that's not a universal um, feeling. And so I thought it'd be good to have a conversation, especially if we look at uh, some of the things happening on and off campus from environmental activism uh, to racial justice, economic justice, uh, you know, peace, et cetera. Um, so you know, I'm chairing. Um, I will call up uh, my colleagues in a moment. I don't want to spend too much time because I want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, I do have a brief summary. It, it is interesting actually doing this. Uh, I tried numerous, numerous searches and couldn't really find any sort of clear delineation of the sort of pros and cons or arguments for and against scholarly activism. Um, so I, I did make a brief list of some of the issues that have come up in conversation. Um, anyone, obviously, when we get to the uh, more interactive part can add, and as well as any of my colleagues can add. Um, anything that's not on the list. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce myself and then before I get to some of the issues that I noted for consideration, I'll obviously have our, my other guests um, and colleagues introduce themselves uh, and some of their work as well. So let me uh, just start from there. So we're going to go through introductions, a quick overview of issues, and then um, I did have some questions for consideration, but other um, things can also be considered, of course. Um, back to that. Uh, so some criticism of the scholar activists. This is uh, from Foucault from 1980. The intellectual no longer has to play the role of an advisor. The, the project, tactics, and goals to be adopted are a matter of those who do the fighting. What the intellectual can do is provide the instruments of analysis. So sort of the, uh, we do the research, and then those who want to be active can take that research and use it to, to their ends. Um, and so some of the criticisms that, that have come up about the scholar activists and conversations that I've had is that activi activities outside the classroom, even when left at the door, have an impact inside the classroom, uh, which in some ways I, uh, you know, connects to the second. Uh, it demonstrates over biases. Uh, oftentimes I, I would say that this is framed as being, you know, a left-wing bias. Um, you know, I've had, I did it one year visiting at University of Rhode before I was here, and I had a colleague who, uh, said, you know, the academy should stay within the academy, um, that we should not actually be out there doing, you know, I mean, not only necessarily activism, but necessarily like, um, uh, in, you know, public intellectual discourse, engaging with issues in the broader community. Uh, and actually, I was told that um, some of the pieces that I had written, um, I should not be writing because it, since I was criticizing the Democratic Party from the left, that I was only serving to help the right. Uh, and I look at it as I don't have any obligation to you know, censor myself for, I mean, I think that's the epitome of sort of nonpartisanship. Um, if you, and then in some ways it's inherently partisan to not voice your opinion simply because it uh, affects the uh, political discourse in this country. Um, oh, there was more, sorry. Uh, that it's also, it can be a form of indoctrination, especially if you're very overt in the classroom. Um, conflict of interest, it could create an uncomfortable classroom environment for those with different views. Um, and another one was to compel students to participate. Uh, you know, I've been active with different student groups on campus from Amnesty International, which I advise uh, the students for, I'm sorry, Society for Ethics, Peace, and Global Affairs, Creative Peace Initiatives, and a new initiative called U.S. Foreign Policy Activist Co-op, which is made up of students, staff, and faculty. Um, and I've had two students participate, both at the grad level. I've never had a student ever come up to me and say, or even ask whether you know it would affect their grade if they don't participate. And so I've had hundreds of students here, and only two apparently felt, quote unquote, compelled to participate. So on the flip side, support for the scholar activist. From Chomsky from 67, this is, a, of course, during a different time, the, the Vietnam War um, protests. But Chomsky says, quote, with respect to the responsibility of intellectuals, intellectuals are in a position to expose the lies of governments, to analyze actions according to their causes and motives and often hidden intentions. 
In the Western world, at least, they have the power that comes from political liberty, from access to information and freedom of expression. For a privileged minority, Western democracy provides the leisure, the facilities, and the training to seek truth, lying hidden behind the veil of distortion and misrepresentation, ideology, and class interest through which the events of current history are present, presented to us. And I feel like in some ways, the civil rights era, the anti-Vietnam War era, I, I feel like there was in some ways a different, not that institutions didn't respond to scholar activists in some ways negatively, um, but I do think it would seem like a different era where maybe things have changed, now the scholar activist is not seen um, in the same way that it was previously. And so some of the support for the scholar activist um, you know, again, I mean, Chomsky lays out that uh, academics and intellectuals are a privileged minority and therefore have some responsibilities. Um, and you can take that, you know, I mean, obviously, Chomsky comes from, again, a very left ideology. Um, but so you'd have to make the same case, of course, for, um, for the right wing scholar activists as well, or conservative scholar activists. Uh, translate thought into action. As I mentioned, um, I was told that we should not step outside of the ivory tower. Um, but some would say we have a responsibility to do so. Uh, engage community. And then the last one that is especially speaks to, to my work. Uh, I've had numerous students come up to me who, you know, I've, I've done a number of events that provide different perspectives, uh, maybe outside of whatever you want to call the Washington Consensus or the status quo or the mainstream, um, who said they didn't know that there were professors that, uh, that thought that way and had those kind of values and belief systems. Um, and students who told me before that they didn't really feel comfortable um, sort of speaking up in class because they've had their, their peers in a lot of ways sort of fit inside that sort of, again, mainstream um, thoughts. And then so they felt sort of isolated. And so for me, knowing that I've sort of provided space for students uh, who do think outside of the mainstream is something that I, that I value. And so um, I mean, that, that's, that's primarily what I wanted to say before we get to some of the issues and the um, questions for discussion. Uh, the last thing I would just note is, again, this, this new venture, the U.S. Foreign Policy Activist Co-op, is meant to provide space for students, faculty, and staff who are inclined and have certain values to work together rather than it always being, you know, one initiative or coming from one direction or the other. It's, it's working together, uh, completely non-hierarchical. Um, where, again, those who feel comfortable and inclined to um, speak out against issues, especially related to human rights and U.S. foreign policy, have that space to do so. And so with that, I will um, call up my fellow panelists here, and then after their introductions, I can quickly go through the uh, questions that I pose for further discussion, and then we can open it up to conversation. Shift this all just so I have access to the computer. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Cynthia, why don't you uh, start us off with your? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Cynthia Jones, and I teach at the Washington College of Law. I teach criminal law, criminal procedure, and evidence. Um, and I do a lot of research and scholarship in the area of wrongful convictions and racial disparities in the criminal justice system. And um, I sit on several boards, which I can talk about when I get to the, the main presentation. And a lot of what I try to do is engage students and to get them active during the formative years while they're in law school um, and involved in professional organizations. Um, and, uh, you know, I consider my job, in addition to being a teacher, educator, um, and scholar, um, raising the next generation of activists. Um, I think that's critical that whatever it is you, whatever cause you support, or challenge or champion, um, that you should be active and engaged in that and give back. Um, and so that's sort of very much infused in, in my teaching and in my scholarship, how to engage students and get them uh, passionate about something. Very frequently, what I say to my students when they come in for career counseling is, what are, what are you passionate about? And sometimes they go, I don't know. I'm thinking, well, we've got some work to do. <laughs> so. 
team. We're just interested in it. Um, my name is Jamie Raskin. I um, am a colleague of Cynthia's at the law school. I teach constitutional law and the First Amendment and legislation and political process. Um, and I'm the uh, director of the program of law and government and the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project. Nancy, do you want them to do their presentations before? Or do you want to? No, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, Cynthia, why don't you tell us about uh, some more about your work that you had planned today? Oh, yeah. you're going to introduce yourself? Oh, yes, you can. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that first. Um, hi, I'm Fantav, and I work in the Office of Campus Life, and I also teach in the School of International Service. Okay. So, um, one of the things that happens very frequently, at least with law students, and I think must happen with undergraduate students, they are not, sometimes they're very much not clear on what they want to do. Uh, they come to school and they are looking to find what they're passionate about. They were told to come to college. They came to law school because their parents told them to come to law school or they thought it was a good thing to do. Um, and so I think there's some responsibility that we have to try to guide and direct them. Not tell them what to think, but try to guide and direct them. Uh, when students come and they actually know what they're passionate about, we have a phenomenon at the law school. I don't know if you've seen this, Jamie, where uh, because our law school is known for its international human rights work, students come in and they say, you know, what do you want to do? International human rights. Mm -hmm. But what aspect of it? International human rights. Mm -hmm. I want to help people and make the world a better place. I was like, okay, so do you want to work, you know, with you know, Amnesty International? International human rights. So it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't progressed beyond a topic. Uh, so getting them to think, again, what you're passionate about it is sometimes a challenge. And very frequently, the phenomenon happens that that's their response in their first year. And then by the end of their first year, they come back and say, I came here wanting to do international human rights. Now I'm not so sure I like it. Now I have no idea what I want to do. And I say, OK, well, let's talk through some things. But one of the things I, I try to do with professional organizations that I belong to where I sit on the board is to either have them have um, a student membership of the board uh, to get students involved in the professional community or invite students to participate or have a student rate for students to participate in the events of those <coughs> professional organizations. Sometimes that's the first time a student's ever gone to a professional conference. It's intimidating um, and they come in and say, I don't know what to wear, I don't know what to do. But that initial step towards uh, their activism is very important. Uh, having a faculty member literally explain, this is where you go and this is what you should do when you get there. Um, I think that a lot of times we think about activism as being, you know, um, Greenpeace and, you know, laying down on the mall and, and, and petitioning. But I always say, you know, you're an intellectual. You can do that, but you can also, you know, engage in the kind of work to change the law to actually make policy. Um, and there, there are official mechanisms you can work through. You're in the District of Columbia, you can work on the Hill, you can work at the State Capitol, you can do all kinds of things, but you have to first find what you're passionate about. Um, and some conversation with them about that usually steers them in a particular direction. Um, I think it's our job. I think it's our job to help them figure that out or at least put them in a position to figure it out. And sometimes it's eliminating the stuff that they are not passionate about. Like, what about um, Will's trust in the states? So like, no, I'm not into that. I'm like, all right, we're closer. We're closer already. What about this? I don't want to do transactional sex. Like, so you want to work with children. OK, that opens up a whole range of things, the Children's Legal Defense Fund and a whole range of opportunities. Um, and they come back, and it's students have left my office and said, OK, I feel like I have a purpose now and a plan. Um, and it's so empowering to them. And then you, that, that first internship or externship, and they want to talk to you about it. I think if they feel that we're disengaged from the community and disengaged from activism and that we're just teaching in the ivory tower, I think it's more likely that they're not going to become engaged. And we're in Washington, D.C., where there are all these opportunities. And it would be a shame if we weren't actively sort of pushing them. Go, go try some different things and, and have some experiences. Um, so some of the specific things that I've done. Um, I worked on the board of the Innocence Project, and like I said, I do a lot of research on wrongful convictions. Getting students actually out investigating cases um, and pulling records and finding police reports and witnesses, um, I cannot think of anything more satisfying than being a part of a team that exposed a wrongful conviction and got a person out of prison who's been there for usually decades. Um, and we've had students do that. 
um, supervising students who engage in other forms of advocacy. Uh, um, I work with the sentencing project and mandatory minimums and, and those kinds of things. I find that students will gravitate towards you if it's pretty clear what it is, what causes you champion. They won't find you. They'll you know, call, call you up and say, I hear you do work on X, Y, or Z. Um, so to the extent that we put it out there, what we're passionate about and what causes we're interested in, I think the students will come to us and I think it creates a golden opportunity and an out of class teaching moment for us to, to help them find their passion and put them on a path uh, towards activism. So no, we should not shy away from it. We should embrace it and, and, uh, and uh, go full-fledged full into it. Thank you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> um, so let's see. So um, Jeff posed us the question, uh, is it appropriate for faculty to take an activist position? Um, and so uh, I very much appreciate the question because I've been uh, in academia for 24 years and I have um, intertwined academics and activism for all 24 years, uh, but I've never really thought systematically about the question. And it sounds like from your research, nobody really has or th there's not a lot of um, theory about it um, and um, so it was an interesting exercise to try to think it through um, and um, uh, I kept coming back in my thinking to John Dewey who was the first president of the American Association of University of uh, College Professors University Professors um, who said that um, that theory without uh, practice is empty, practice without theory is blind. Um, and so um, w when I thought it through, I came up with an answer. And, and I, and I want to fault you, Jeff, because you took about four or five hours away from an article I was supposed to have been writing, but I really got into this. Um, and so here's my answer, um, yeah, that it is appropriate for faculty to take an activist position um, when three elements are present, okay? It's a three-part test. One, it does not detract from one's teaching or scholarship or service, but rather enriches, infuses, and advances your teaching, your scholarship, and your service. Two, um, if the activism is consistent with general academic values by being um, pragmatic and dialectical in the Dewey sense, rather than ideological, and I'll come back and explain that. And the third is that if the activism is consistent with the professor's own personal academic uh, ideas and intellectual values. Um, so let me go to the first one, that it, it cannot, and what, what I want to do is to try to flesh it out a little bit through examples of things that I think are appropriate and good, and then things that I think are cross, cross a line, okay. Um, and, and I should say before I start, I think that this three-part test that um, I've improvised is a, uh, applies across disciplinary boundaries, but it will probably make the most sense, uh, if it makes sense to anybody, to Cynthia and me, because uh, in the law school context, I think that the search for truth, which I take to be the ultimate grounded academic value, is very closely intertwined with the search for justice, and it's hard to disentangle them in the law in the law school case. But I think I'd be willing to try to argue it that it would apply across the board. Okay, um, so number one, it cannot detract from your teaching, your scholarship, and service, but should enrich and infuse and inform um, all three of them. Um, and so I, I want to, uh, of the different projects I've been involved in, I want to talk about one of them and how I think uh, I would argue that it meets this test, okay? And it's something that happened uh, now, gee, um, 15 years ago, um, or more than 15 years ago, kind of the incident that kicked it off happened. Uh, I had a phone call from um, the son of one of our colleagues, Elliot Milstein, um, and his son was at Blair High School in Montgomery County, and he said, uh, he's part of the CAP program, the Communication Arts program, and we have a monthly cable TV show where we do a debate. And this was so back in 1998, 
they put together a debate on the then almost unmentionable subject of gay marriage, and they had two conservatives and two liberals debating it, and they had an agreement with the school system that it would be run every month, but this month, um, the superintendent's representative had said, well, um, on your, your debate about um, gay marriage, we don't want to go live, tape it, send it in to us, and then you know, we'll get back to you. So they taped it, they sent it in, and they got an email message back saying, we are not going to be running uh, Shades of Grey this month. We'll see you next month when you do your show about um, class size. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, so the students were very upset. The teacher was very upset. Uh, it's, you know, somebody, uh, Jake knew that I was a First Amendment professor, called me up and he said, well, can they do this? And I said, well, it kind of depends on the reason that they're canceling your show. Yeah. Is it because they object to the content of the speech? on the show that you put together? Or is it because they need that time for the superintendent to have uh, a press conference about homework or something else? And so he said, well, we don't know. I said, well, send them an email and say, why are you not running it? So they sent off an email. Then they get a message back from the director of the county public schools cable station saying, uh, well, you can tell Professor Raskin that our reason for not running the show had nothing to do with the content of the speech on the show. It's because of what the speakers were saying. Okay? Uh, and um, so I said, well, that's about as close as you can get to a smoking gun in a First Amendment case. And so I, I uh, developed a little project where I got some of my First Amendment students, and we went and we represented them. And we wanted to go to court right away, but the high school kids said, no, let's appeal through the school system, which turned out to be the right decision. And we taught them about the, all the Supreme Court cases dealing with the rights of students um, and created kind of a little seminar for the high school kids. And then we ended up going to the school board and they reversed on a close vote, it was four to three, they reversed the censorship and then decided to run the debate about gay marriage uh, a dozen times, uh, which was 12 more uh, 12 times more than they were going to run it originally, and actually got all this attention. It was on NPR and the Washington Post and everything. Um, and so then it was, it was an interesting question because afterwards we started getting all these calls from kids who wanted you know, representation. The first one was a, a girl who had a um, tattoo on her thigh which said, um, F the uptight, racist, sexist establishment, or something like that. And, uh, uh, you know, and the, the school may, said she could only wear long pants or, or a dress. She couldn't, you know, it, it had to be covered up, and she thought it violated her first rights. So we started getting all the, and, and I said, you know what, I, I don't know that we're going to be able to go all over the country and represent all these people. Um, but I said, it gave me an idea because the schools that should be teaching students about constitutional rights and liberties are trampling their constitutional rights and liberties. And it gave me an idea for a service project um, and an intellectual project. And I ended up writing a book, which just came out in its fourth edition, uh, called We the Students, Supreme Court Cases for and About America's Students, where I compiled all of the cases, excerpted them, and then wrote about them and how they'd been interpreted, and then had a series of questions. Um, and then we launched a project called the, with the families of Thurgood Marshall and William Brennan called the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project because Marshall and Brennan were two justices that always talked about the importance of educating young people about their rights. So the idea is we take our law students who are into constitutional law, who've done well at it, and many of whom have had experience teaching or want experience teaching, and send them out to public high schools in D.C. and in Maryland to teach a course on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And we've been doing that since um, 1999. Um, and so for 15 years we've been doing it, and I've written and other faculty involved, like um, uh, Steve Vermeil and Leah Epperson, a colleague of ours who's an education professor, have written a lot of articles that draw on the experience of our students. Our students have written a lot of law review articles about it. I wrote a law review article, which I brought some copies of, and once one about the whole project and about how it's a service project, an activist service project in the world that has been very fruitful in terms of the creation of scholarship uh, and teaching, and of course, service, which is what the District of Columbia uh, appreciates. And in fact, the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, praised the Marshall Brennan project in a, a big speech saying that this is something that law schools around the country should be doing. We are now at 20 law schools 
um, from coast to coast, north to south, so we're sort of all over the place. So that would be an example where I think we've done something that meets the test, that it advances what the, the described role morality is of, uh, of law professors and uh, law schools. This is what we should be doing, is engaging in scholarship that's immediately useful and uh, practical for people, uh, teaching that moves the students, that opens students up, um, and then service that renders a real contribution to the community that we're part of. So we're very proud of that. Now, um, counter examples are easy to think of. Um, fortunately, not at our school. I don't know of any. But there are, of course, professors who engage in activism outside of the academic role in a way that undermines their teaching, their intellectual and academic credibility, uh, and real service. I mean, a famous example from um, a decade ago was uh, that of the French professor Robert Forgisson. And he had a, uh, an American compatriot um, whose, um, uh, I can't remember his first name, but he was Professor Butts, who was a professor of computer science. But these guys decided that the Holocaust had not taken place. They joined the Holocaust revisionist movement. Um, neither of them were historians, um, so it wasn't within any field of intellectual specialty. And they went out and they joined this movement um, in a way that you know caused pandemonium and tumult in their classes um, and exposed their schools to all kinds of uh, criticism uh, for what they were doing and did not advance um, the intellectual project and didn't serve anybody um, and didn't rent, render you know any service. Um, the, the, another a recent example comes from a former professor of mine. At, at Harvard, uh, Alan Dershowitz, and you can look this one up online. I didn't have time to put the whole thing up, but you can check it out easily. He wrote a book called The Case for Israel that turned out to have been mostly plagiarized from another book um, that was wrong on all kinds of facts, that was incredibly provocative, um, that stirred up huge controversy, but did not advance the teaching mission. It had nothing to do with what he was teaching. It did not advance the development of scholarship in any way, um, and it certainly didn't render any service. But you can check out the whole debate between Alan Dershowitz and Norman Finkelstein online, and there's an extraordinary uh, uh, debate between them that was on the radio. I think it was uh, NPR or Pacifica, where Dershowitz was forced to admit that large chunks of this book were basically plagiarized from another book called From Time Immemorial by Joan Peters, basically because he had delegated the writing of the book to a research assistant mm -hmm. to, you know, and didn't. Now, his colleague Lawrence Tribe got into a, uh, a similar kind of situation, but he admitted it. He said this was sloppy on my part, a, a student did it, but uh, Dershowitz kind of dug his, his heels into it. So that would be an example of activism, I think, that is way outside of the professional role, where it's not within your discipline, it's not within your field of expertise. It doesn't uplift the educational process. Uh, it doesn't improve teaching. Um, and it doesn't render real service. And so I think that's where it's most suspect. All right, so the, the second um, the element that I suggested was it should be consistent with general academic values by being pragmatic and dialectical in the Dewey sense rather than ideological. Um, and it doesn't mean, of course, that everybody will agree with what you're saying. But at least it's within the spirit of academic inquiry that people can disagree with you in a civil way, and you can move the ball forward in terms of uh, in terms of understanding. Um, we have a colleague, Amanda Frost, who's written some about this, and uh, another former professor of mine, Richard Fallon at Harvard, has written about this issue um, about the the role morality of um, of law professors. Um, the, there's an interesting article that's just come out by um, the dean of the Yale Law School, Robert Post. Um, he said, let's go back to Dewey's uh, original presidency of the, um, uh, the Association of American College Professors, I think it was called at the time. Um, and when they talked about academic freedom, they had something very similar in mind. If I were to poll this room about what does academic freedom mean, most people would take would take a kind of First Amendment analogy 
saying, well, First Amendment freedom just means that as a professor you can say whatever you want without fear of reprisal or recrimination or firing, and that, of course, is the traditional justification for tenure. Um, but in its inception, the idea of academic freedom had a much more specific meaning, which is you have a right to disagree with intellectual orthodoxy and convention, to use all of the whole arsenal of academic research, the gathering of facts, the development of theory, the presentation of argument, in order to contradict an established academic orthodoxy and to move the ball forward in terms of understanding whether we're in the natural sciences, the physical sciences, or the social sciences. Um, and so in that sense, um, I think that we want our activism to be consistent with that vision of pragmatic dialectical discourse. It itself has got to be subject to questioning and interrogation. The Marshall Brennan Project, which is my big example here, we, we should be, people should ask questions about what we're doing and how effective has it been in terms of promoting constitutional literacy values. So there are ways we can improve it, which undoubtedly there are. There are other law schools that have joined us that have contributed uh, new ways of thinking about being in the public schools and so on. So just because you're an activist doesn't insulate you from the academic process of um, questioning and dialectics, and that's something that we should relish and enjoy um, and invite. And finally, um, I've got one minute, two minutes to go. So f the final element um, that I suggested was that it, the activism should be consistent with not just the academic values of the institution and the profession, but the personal values of the professor. Now, why do I say that? Because oftentimes these discussions, as Jeff kicked us off with, um, become an opportunity to go after professors who are active in the world in different ways. Um, but they're never brought to bear on professors who happen to be active um, through, for example, professional consultancy agreements where they're paid to do something. And I think that that's where this element comes in the most. There are lots of professors in all kinds of disciplines who are paid as consultants for pharmaceutical corporations, for energy corporations, to do certain kinds of work. Um, I, I think, you know, and that's legit within the rules of the university and so on, but I do think that in addition to being consistent with the intellectual and academic values of the profession, it should be consistent with the intellectual um, commitments and values and ideals of the professor him or herself. I mean, but I know of cases, again, not at our school, but I know of cases where people have written about a particular subject and then rent their brains out um, and are paid to take a position totally opposite to it. And as lawyers, I think that puts people in a very difficult position that you've got to zealously advocate the view of a, of a client who's able to pay you a lot of money in a way that's inconsistent with what you've written about the subject or what you believe the law ought to be or your understanding of what the law is. I think that's a, that's a serious issue. Um, and at the very least, there needs to be um, some transparency about that. Um, if you are changing your position because you're taking a case or you're a paid expert for a particular kind of position and it's different from the things you've written about um, before. It, that's just to broaden the subject to say that there are lots of different kinds of activism and one kind of activism is an activism of consultancy where, you know, and uh, Dershowitz again would be a pretty big example of this. There's another scandal that's going on with Dershowitz right now. I don't need to get it. But in any event, uh, uh, the, 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 that would be my suggestion. Those th three things. It should, uh, one, advance your teaching, your scholarship, your service. Two, it should be consistent with the overall academic values of the institution and profession. And three, it should be consistent and coherent in terms of your own intellectual commitments. Thank you, David. Fantastic. Um, so my... I'm in a different position in that wearing multiple hats, I'm placed in um, what I would say some challenging situations perhaps. Um, I work full time in the Office of Campus Life and work primarily with students who are on a whole spectrum in terms of their political orientation um, and spend a lot of time sort of hearing their perspective on that issue and I'll talk, I'll talk to that in a few minutes. But then I also teach graduate courses in the School of International Service, um, primarily in the area of international education 
um, and also wear the hat of president of my association, um, and it's NAFSA, the Association of International Educators. Um, and the work that I do with NAFSA intersect a lot with my classes because of the subject matter. Um, and as an association, we play quite a bit of a role in public policy work. And in my role in particular, I have to represent the association that I work. So I'm quite mindful of what I bring to the classroom as a result of that work. And there are a couple of things that I wanted to kind of react to and respond to. One is um, this idea, I think, you know, um, Jamie, that you raised about the three kind of tests. And I would uh, absolutely concur with those three levels of tests that I think we need to meet in the classroom if we're gonna be effective. And I think also, Jeff, in your PowerPoint, you talked about some of the, you know, um, some of the arguments perhaps against activism with the notion of overt biases, et cetera. Two things come to mind for me. One is that I have come to find out very quickly in my classroom that yes, we come in as faculty member and it is about the truth, but we have to ask ourselves the fundamental question, whose truth are we really talking about? And I think as, a fa as faculty, we have to constantly keep asking that question of ourselves and of our students. The second has to do with knowledge. Whose knowledge is privileged and why? The conversation that we've had so far has also omitted, and this I will betray my discipline, sociology. I think one thing that it has omitted is the notion of power. And the fact that faculty in the classroom do carry tremendous power. Whether we own it or not, the students know it. And as a result, I think it does create a certain dynamic in the classroom in the ways in which our students will respond to us based on the subject matter, the content, and the way in which we deliver that information. So I've come to realize quickly a couple of things. One is that I cannot come in the classroom with the assumption that all of our students come into the classroom with wanting to do, or wanting to do it the way we think it should be done. And so in this class in particular, because it is about international education, one of the things that I've had to force myself to do with my students is that we spend a lot of time talking about public policy work and what does it involve, and also looking at the history of public policy within the field that I'm in. And I've had to really ask my students to, depending on what position they hold, to really make the effort to go and understand the opposite side of it. And to actually engage fully in understanding what the opposite side of that is. Because I fundamentally believe that in doing so, they're gonna be more effective in carrying out their message without being blind to it, as you've mentioned in terms of understanding the theory to practice. And some of our students are challenged by that. And they're often challenged by it because the first thing they'll ask me is, well, what do I need to do that? It's already in the news in many places. It's already out there, we know what it is. Well, do you really understand what might be the rationale behind it? You may be hearing about it in the news, but do you actually understand what might be the rationale around it? And so I say this to say that I think in the work that we do, and when we do bring this activism orientation to our classes, we do have to make sure that we're not making the assumption that all of our students have the same appetite for it. And that more importantly, even if they do, we really do need to help them to be as critical in whatever side they're on is one of the first things that I would raise. The second thing that I also give my students as an example is that my students have interest in working in different areas of, of, this, of this work. And some of it, their political leaning does really matter. So I give them the example that, for example, with my association, we used to be an association that used to get grants from the State Department. After 9-11, when we took a very strong stance against some of the government action, we had to make a very strong decision about whether or not we could continue to receive grants because the State Department made it very clear to us that they were not exactly happy with the direction that we're taking. And the association made the, the decision to no longer accept any government grant. That was a risk that we took. But it was important for me to share that with my students because I think when we also talk to our students about activism, they need to judge for themselves the risk that they're taking. Because some of those same students will have an interest in working at the State Department or other places, and it does really matter what they've engaged with and how they've engaged in those, in those different areas. And so that's the second element that I would raise as well is that we need to be mindful of the fact that our students are coming into the classes. They want to get as much knowledge as they can, but they also have different ambitions. And understanding those ambitions, but also understanding the risk involved, I do think we have an obligation as faculty to at least expose the students to the risk mm -hmm. and to un for them to understand and make their own judgments about what is acceptable and what is not. So that is the second thing that I would raise is really helping our students understand the risk involved in activism. The third thing that I would also say is that 
Now we're also, I think many of us in our classrooms are using um, social media and technology as an active tool for learning. And in some cases, we encourage our students to use blogs. We encourage them to use different sources for getting their voices out. Again, I've had to remind myself and my students that as they're using blogs, as they're using other tools, this is permanent. It doesn't disappear. Just because you've decided that you're gonna put it out there today, that tomorrow, that that will no longer exist. And so again, we have to remind our students about what is the, you know, what the, you know, what's the implication of the use of technology, of the use of your voice. Now, in doing so, what I, I'm very clear with my students is, in coming into this class, I also have to spend a lot of time creating cognitive dissonance. I'm one who really believes that learning happens with tremendous cognitive dissonance. Our students come with tremendous assumptions about what they believe, what they know, what they think. And throughout the class, we spend tremendous amount of time in that, in that endeavor. So one of the things that you mentioned, Jeff, was this idea of uncomfortable classroom environment. I'm not necessarily concerned about the uncomfortable aspect of it. What I'm concerned about is if, in fact, by creating that uncomfortable classroom environment, it impedes learning. That's when it becomes a problem. And so that's something that I strongly am mindful of. I often say to my students, you're going to be very uncomfortable in this class because I will challenge a lot of your assumptions and I will play devil's advocate along the way because that's my job. And also you're gonna feel really uncomfortable. So that's part of your learning. But if it begins to impede on, on your learning, then that's when it becomes an issue. So that's the hat as a faculty member. I now would like to shift to talking about my hat in working in campus life and working with students. Because I think that's a different role. And in that role I have to be very mindful of wearing my politics on my sleeve because I work with students from a whole spectrum of, of belief systems. And in that endeavor, I'm fortunate that I really get students who open up a lot. And it's our students who are not our mainstream students. These are not the students who will necessarily come to us or to our classes and sort of say, you know what? You brought up this subject matter and I really genuinely disagree with your perspective on it because the students understand the power dynamics. They understand it. And as a result of understanding that, there's some risk that they're not willing to take. So because of my role outside of the classroom, I hear a lot about those. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things I think come up in terms of what I hear from those students, and it has to do with what you talked about, um, you know, Jamie, and that has to do with how does this then really facilitate learning versus inhibiting learning? And this is where I think there's a, there's a balancing act, right? I think there's a balancing act because for some of those students, when we think we're facilitating learning, in their mind, we're actually inhibiting learning. And we're not always sure where that fine line is. And that's a line that I think we're constantly, in many ways, are juggling and are constantly trying to figure out ways to balance. And students may not always feel comfortable in opening themselves up in the ways in which we would like for them to do so in those, in those different settings. So that would be one thing that I would bring up in terms of the, the discussion here. The other thing as well is that um, recently with the you know, Ferguson incident and so forth, um, certainly, you know, some of our students were really very, very, you know, upset about all of the events that have taken place. And in doing so, really wanted to make sure that they didn't leave their activism at the door and that they were able to bring that activism into the classroom where they felt the classroom was exactly the place for those kinds of mm -hmm. important and courageous conversations. And in those spaces, I think, it became also evident that sometimes for faculty, it was a challenge because faculty did not necessarily know where's, what's the right balance? Where do we engage in this? How do we engage in it fully? And then more importantly, how do we engage in it in a way that it won't explode in the classroom? And I think it created a lot of anxiety for the faculty who were not sure on how to handle that. And yet I would say that for the students who were coming into those classes, they would be the first to say that in some ways, it really denied them an important part of learning at that specific time. Whereas for the faculty, from the faculty perspective, this was something that needed to be left outside of the class because it, there was just not a place or a space for it. Mm -hmm. So those are some of my observations about just, I think, this, this topic mm -hmm. in general. Thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna pull up that, that final slide. Uh, I mean, I don't know if we're able to go a little over 12.15 or not, but I mean, I'm happy to stay a little longer. Um, uh, just one comment I was going to make related to what you, you know, uh, Fonto said about the State Department and also social media. Um, I, I had a student who follows me on Twitter who uh, said, for a moment, she, she ended up retweeting, but for a moment hesitated to retweet 
um, you know, tweet to an article. I don't know if it was an article I had written or someone else. Um, but she said, I might want to work for the government. I didn't know if it was okay for me to retweet this. Uh, I've had heard certain other similar things about Facebook. Uh, and then I've had grad students who are working for the uh, State Department. And you know, in, in the check for the security clearances, they still ask questions like, has this student ever yeah. uh, not shown sufficient love of the country, or, you know, something yeah. like that. And yeah. it's like, I mean, is this still communism and the Red Scare? And I, I, was, I was a little shocked that, I mean, actually I wasn't, yeah. I should take that back, I was not surprised. <laughs> um, but so just some, some things, I mean, some of this we've already kind of covered up here and certainly any thoughts of you, and you don't have to comment on any of this, they feel free to go a complete away from all of this. Um, but you know, what, how is activism defined? What is labeled activism and what is excluded from being labeled as such? Uh, are certain forms of activism more acceptable than others? So if you're um, you know, a climate activist uh, slash faculty, you know, uh, scholar activist, then you know, of course there's lots of students who are supporting that as well as racial justice. Uh, are those more acceptable than other forms? Uh, are certain positions more acceptable than others, et cetera? So I don't want to go through all that because we are short on time. But just some issues for consideration, but of course, again, any thoughts any of you have um, that diverge entirely from any of this? Or can, can I make just one comment? One of the things that um, becomes a very delicate balance in the classroom is trying to figure out how to profess, how yeah. to make yeah. your point, um, and not isolate students. And, and you talked a little bit about that. Um, Many controversial topics come up in criminal law and in constitutional law, whether it's abortion or rape or um, racism, uh, and trying to deal with that and create that comfortable space for students to have that conversation without the students who are very conservative or extremely liberal um, feeling offended. Um, I've had many of conversations, in fact, every time I teach rape in my criminal law class where I have to first give the speech that there is a zero percent chance that there's not someone in this classroom who has not been affected by this issue personally, either themselves, close friend or family member, as a victim or as an accused. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be mindful of that because inevitably one of the cases will raise a question and someone will want to say, well, she was asking for it. And I go, oh, yeah. We're going to cut that off. Um, and I've inevitably had students who said, you know, I worked for a rape crisis center. And uh, women, and they have very strong views. I think the classroom is the place to have that conversation. And it does make a lot of students very uncomfortable. Um, but I think it's the place to have that. And I think mm -hmm. it's our job to manage that. Mm -hmm. It's to, to recognize that it's uncomfortable and to manage that level of, of, of discomfort. And I always say, if you can't articulate the arguments on the other side, how do you know that your position is right? You should be able to understand and articulate it. And it, it's a delicate balance, especially when you're dealing with the controversial issues of the day. And so in dealing with the, the post-Brown and Ferguson issues in my class, I took it head on. I said, this is, this is exactly what the law is. You now let's talk about reform, but I'm not gonna shy away from that, that discussion. It's on their minds, and even if I'm not talking about it, you know, they're probably reading about it on Facebook while I'm talking about it. <laughs> so I might as well, you know, my job is always to be more interesting than Facebook. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't. Um, but but the, the final point I wanted to make before I guess we, we turn over to audience questions is this social media profile. Um, with law students, with undergraduate students, I don't know that we do enough yeah. to, to make them understand yeah. that now you can't post whatever thought happens to come into your head. You can't tweet every little thing because definitely a friend of mine who's a managing partner at a law firm says that's the first thing we do yeah. is check the person's online profile. What have they been blogging about, tweeting about? And I thought, my gosh, I don't know that students fully appreciate that. And it goes back to their undergrad years. Yeah. You know, some of them come straight through. So I, don't, I think that as activists as we want to be, we're in very different positions yeah. career-wise, and we need to make sure that they are profoundly aware. Be activists, but you know, if you want to work for the State Department, or if you want to go into JAG Corps with yeah. the military, this might not be a good idea for you. So mm -hmm. I think that balance needs to be struck. Yes. So what tips could you give some of us for managing that kind of dynamic in the classroom? And you said, you know, take it on head on. Okay, now what? You know what, I, I, I do try to strike balance. And so I remember, I think the best time I ever did it, um, I, you know, as a former public defender and sort of lefty, a student at the mm -hmm. end of class where we were talking about the death penalty came up and said, 
just to be clear, Professor Jones, are you for or against the death penalty? I was like, success. <laughs> success. You had no idea. So I think sometimes, and, and Jeff was talking about at the beginning, finding articles that take the opposite position. I love playing devil's advocate and, and challenging the students who actually have my own view. So, for example, in Brown Ferguson saying, you know, police officers have a very tough job. You know, as, as Eric Holder has said, they have a right to come home. So don't you think they should err on the side of shoot first, ask questions later when their safety is at? Of course I don't think that. And there were students whose hands shot up, right? And so they got to talk. I'm like, well, I mean, and, and, and getting them engaged, even if they think they are responding to, you know, my own belief, <laughs> getting them talking, and, and the other way is making it clear that there's no right answer. It's like, what do you think about this proposition? You can think whatever you, you want to think, and then we sort of pick away at it. But mm -hmm. I think coming up with a balance in that courtroom, in the classroom, in the courtroom <laughs> coming up with that balance is the way to do it, and sometimes playing that devil's advocate role and not saying, this is what I think should have happened with Brown or Garner, but let's, let's, let's play devil's advocate and getting them to talk. And just to add to Cynthia's point, I mean, I try to set the ground rules on day one. I mean, the first word out of my mouth is there is no bar of political correctness or ideological correctness in this classroom. Anybody can say anything they want. You don't even have to believe it. You can try it on to see if it works for you. Because I'm assuming that everybody's ideas, I'm hoping everybody's ideas are in motion, are in development. And so it's not a parliament. People are not there to represent a position. They're there to learn. Um, and the idea that there are two sides to every question is ridiculous. There's a million sides to every question. There's a, a whole spectrum of belief and values and ideas out there. And we want to welcome it and we want, we want to tease out as much as possible everybody's evolving views on everything. And I think if you laid that out at the beginning, people aren't so afraid. And you know, the only other rule that I lay down is no personal attacks. We're not here to humiliate other people in an ad hominem way. But nothing's off limits in terms of ideas, but we're not, you know, and these are the people who are gonna be your friends and your law partners and your colleagues for the rest of your lives. And so, you know, and I would, I try to set that sense of friendship in a community, but nothing's off limits intellectually. The other thing I would, the other thing I would add to that is that it's to really kind of recognize the different learning styles, particularly when you're talking about topics that are really controversial. You're gonna have some students who really, again, you know, Cynthia said, will have a very strong perspective on that. But I use a lot of reflection pieces in my classes, and I found them to be incredibly valuable mm -hmm. in really getting to some of the students who perhaps may not be as vocal in the classroom. And so in those instances, what I will do is, at the end of the class, I will let them know that I probably will be posting uh, you know, a question on Blackboard, and I would like every single student to respond and to have, to have an opportunity. And what I have found is that the students who perhaps didn't have the courage in the classroom to present a perspective really will go, and I will get literally a page full. And then based on that, that then allows me to come back into the classroom the next time with framing some discussion mm -hmm. points and questions that then take it to another level. So I would encourage us to try all these different strategies and not just expect that everyone may feel comfortable with the first round in the classroom to express their viewpoint. Just to, I mean, I would, without being redundant, I'd just say also, I mean, with assignments, I mean, one of the assignments I do force the students to consider uh, a human rights issue from both perspectives. So they have to lay out the pros and cons arguments morally, legally, and as well as the efficacy of the policy. And so by designing assignments like that, I think it's, I'm not asking them to just state one position and defend it. They're being forced to consider the issue. So in terms of assignments, um, you know, grading, it always helps to have rubrics so that uh, you don't have a student who's trying to say that, oh, I got this B because the student, you know, or the professor doesn't agree with my view. Um, so there are other ways outside of you know the classroom also to yeah. Christine then Joe or Joe then Christine uh, just uh, quickly and it's probably more a comment than a question just to, what do we mean by activism how do you refine the notion of activism I mean I think about our students on a uh, spectrum really from you know working in a soup kitchen is activism mm -hmm. getting chaining yourselves to the uh, gates of the White House is activism, mm -hmm. and our students fall along a continuum. Mm -hmm. And I think part of our job is to affirm, frankly, wherever they are along that continuum, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes resist the temptation, <laughs> maybe, to encourage them to get more deeply involved. I don't know. I, I just think we have to affirm where the students are, mm -hmm. and, and, ter and, and where what, and, and, but encourage them to move beyond their comfort level. 
you know, the, I agree with that. Um, in, in our context, uh, you know, working a corporate law firm is a form of activism. Working for the NRA Legal Defense Fund is a form of activism. And our job as law professors is to affirm and uh, everything they're doing and to make them the best possible lawyers they can be in there. You know, we just had an event at the law school yesterday uh, welcoming incoming members of Congress who graduated from WCL uh, and other elected officials in Maryland and Virginia and DC. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm proud of a bunch of them, uh, you know, I had urged to get into public life and some are Republicans, you know, and, uh, some are, and so our job isn't to dictate the content of their political or moral ideals, but it's to make them the most effective person they can be. Right. I mean, the, the program that we're having, uh, Jamie and I are participating in on Monday, is about the Brown Garner killings, and it's called Moving from Rage to Reform. Mm -hmm. And I purposely chose that title. You know, you can be outraged and disgusted about the dysfunction in the criminal justice system, but we're training to be lawyers. You're, you're professionals now. The way you express that, you can have a vigil, you can, you know, mm -hmm. lay down in the street. But let's talk about how we could fix the laws to pr improve it going forward. That's how lawyers communicate. That's how we're activists. Um, so channeling some of that and finding a constructive outlet for some of that I think is good. Not discouraging them from engaging in other forms of activism, but I think we can give it some context and give them an outlet for that that's constructive and advances their career. Uh, that's what I hope we do on Monday at that program. But I think, Joe, the point that you raised about the continuum is a really important one because your description about serving in a soup kitchen would be considered by many of our students as service, mm -hmm. whereas basically chaining yourself to the White House is activism. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that we need to continue to really educate our students about the continuum of effect of that. Activism should just be counterposed to passivity. Yes, mm -hmm. really is an issue. Very helpful conversation. Um, Christine Gettings, I work in the K Spiritual Life Center, and like Fanta, I work in campus life, and so I don't really engage student activists in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, Joe and I do it fairly regularly. And um, I really like what Fanta said, looking at this from a sociological perspective. I mean, not only do we have to consider issues of power when it comes to activism, but I also think increasingly issues of identity. Yeah. Um, I know, at least in my experience, one topic that we will not touch in the Case Spiritual Life Center is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not, and mm -hmm. Jeff knows this too. Um, because mostly it slides up against issues of identity and creating a safe space for students in the work that we do. How do we have these conversations mm -hmm. considering issues of identity? We see this with Ferguson. I'm sure there were a number of students on campus who maybe are children of law enforcement and thought, you know, my dad risks his life every day and you're saying all cops are killers? That's, that's terrible, that's my identity. Or, you know, so we have to have these conversations with students considering the whole selves that they bring to the classroom, their identities, as well as our identities and how they inform us, I think, and also, create bias in the way that we're mentoring them. And I know I often have to sit back and think to myself, okay, I disagree with what the student's saying, it's hitting my own issue or my own identity, and that's an important thing for us to consider. It's more of just a comment than a question, but that's something that increasingly I'm finding is affecting the way that I'm advising students and also planning programs. And especially in, at, in the law school, and I would imagine on main campus, an increasingly international population of students. So you have, you know, I was talking to a student the other day who didn't have an accent at all, and you would have thought she was from Kansas, and in fact she was from Kazakhstan. And so she started talking to me about an issue, and it was very clear that her perspective was very much influenced by that background. And she wanted to make a comment in class, and she goes, I didn't want to offend any of the black students, but I wanted to say that sometimes the African Americans are, you know, provoking the cops. And I said, okay, well, it's good that you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> that probably would have, you know, and so we talked about a way for her to express that and understand that. But I mean, the whole notion of this is a, this is a world in our classroom. Um, one of, uh, we had an adjunct uh, t instructor at the law school who said, I'm sitting in a classroom and, I, and the names, you know, from Falasha Day to whatever, he said, I'm used to teaching at UW where there's a Mary and a, and a Jean. And <laughs> yes. I was like, there are not many Marys and Janes. We have a whole range, but appreciating that uh, global perspective is very important when you're talking about especially controversial international issues. Can I just, one, a little bit of a dissent to it. I mean, I agree ba basically with what you're saying, that people's identity informs the conversation 
is infused with it, but I just wouldn't take anything off of the table because if you can't talk about something at a university, oh, at I a college, I mean, and, and maybe not in the in a spiritual context. Well, that's but, why. And that's yeah, why I but, <laughs> but I mean, nothing should be off of the table as long as we're trying to be as respectful and as civil as possible, and we're we're you know doing and like trying to advance the ball of truth and justice. So how do we get uh, students for Israel together with the students for justice in Palestine to together plan a discussion about the Middle East? You did do it. No. Oh, I'd love to do it. Well, absolutely. <laughs> That's the thing to do. Certain members of our community would not. I would love to do it. Oh, okay. And I, had, I, had, I was going to say, I had Richard. When, when that uh, student said to you that she would have raised this issue of black people provoking cops, Maybe she should have raised that in class and had people deal with that because that is a perception that's out there. Mm -hmm. And I think police, you know, I, I'm a criminal justice professor. Yeah. I'm enormously critical of the justice system, but I'm very upfront about that. Yeah. I teach it. This is what I've learned over the years. <laughs> I think it's a cruel system. I'm going to tell you why. They can fight with it all they want, but I mean, I have, I have a certain way of looking at the system that I think is correct. I mean, you know, it's just I think it is a reasonable conclusion you would draw if you work and look at it. Police and other people, they're right on the firing line of society, unfortunately. They're right on the front line between a society and people who've been left out and oppressed by that society. And they themselves are really bearing the brunt of a lot of our social injustices. Mm -hmm. And they bring some of their prejudices and fears to this job. And people who meet them bring their history to this job. So I would have liked to have your students respond to her. Because if they can't respond to her, they're missing something. Well, I, my concern was that she was going to say something that, in a way that she would have regretted and that would have offended people, and that's the ground rule. You can't be offensive. Black people provoke the cops is offensive, as opposed to people. All people. Well, it was right? She said that's the perception. This is the perception that I have. And then people could say, well, where did you get that perception? Let's talk about that. You have, I mean, that is a controversial topic that you almost have to be able to talk about. No, no, we can talk about it, but I, I want to find a way to talk about it that everybody feels comfortable. No one should get angry. So, for example, we have a, a very controversial case I teach every year where it's about a domestic violence victim who kills the abuser. And she says, you know, I should, under battered women's syndrome, I should not be held accountable for the murder. And there are inevitably a couple of guys who will say, well, she should have just left. And I said, well, you know, remember the reading, the part about learned helplessness and, and the psychological? It's like, I know, but I mean, I wouldn't say if somebody was beating me up. And so eight or nine women, hands go up. And I'm like, hold on for a second. Let me see if I can just frame this for him. Try to save this guy. I go, but can you appreciate the fact that, and so, and, and three or four of them will say, okay, I can see how if you continually get beaten down over the years, you get to the point where you feel like the person is so powerful you can't leave. One or two guys like, no, no, I mean, I, I would have just left. I would have found a way to leave. I would have called somebody to leave. And I was thinking, I gave you a few chances. <laughs> Sisterhood, have at it. And, and, and it was a good conversation, but I don't think I should have turned them on him, right, before trying to, to, to frame it. And they went at it. They went at it. My mother was abused. My sister was abused. And I thought, see? And he's like, oh, I'm not saying, like, your mom couldn't have left. You were saying women, you know. But it was a good conversation. But I, I think that nobody should feel attacked. And I think he would have felt attacked. I think she would have been attacked and felt attacked. And I didn't want her to have that. We did talk about it. But saying, I just think black people provoked it. Like, that's not going to further this discussion. That idea can be expressed. But they're going to attack you. And there's not much I can do to stop that. But I think the, 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 the other point about this is that, you know, in this instance, the student came and had that conversation before, yeah. so you could frame it. Exactly. But we have many instances where that is not the opportunity that comes up. Where we're in the classroom, and it just comes up. <laughs> and this is where I think your point about how do we manage those conversations in a way that allows that student voice to be heard, while at the same time providing kind of the educational forum for others to sort of say, wow, well, that's an interesting perspective, but here's why I have a problem with it, etc. Yes. Right. And what I have found is that in many instances, when we manage them well, it allows for learning for all. But yeah. they're too often the case when it's not managed well. What often will happen is sometimes perhaps the faculty member will jump in, yes. and in jumping in will betray their position very quickly, mm -hmm. and as a result, it just shuts down the conversation. Mm -hmm. And you have one who leaves feeling completely isolated and alienated, and you have others who feel like they didn't have an opportunity to kind of present a perspective. That's when I get concerned about how we're managing these conversations, because I've seen them happen and didn't go very well. 
Well, one of the ways I've done it with the death penalty is to say, regardless of, everybody came to law school with some idea or thought about the death penalty. Regardless of what you think, tell me an argument for or against the death penalty. And I put pro, con on the board, and I, we did it as a, just an open brainstorming. So somebody, anybody, tell me a reason for it. And students like, I think it's morally wrong, but tell me a reason that the other side. And we just did it as, you don't have to take a position, just tell me the viewpoints. And it got out so much. And then we began to break it down. So that's another tool to sort of talk about controversial things. A quick follow-up, I ask students, what evidence would change your mind? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. If there's no evidence that will change it, then it's probably ideological. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very. I hear about it all the time because I oppose the death penalty. I've studied execution teams. I know the cruelty of it. If somebody said to me, you'll save 10 innocent lives with every execution and prove that, it would be a hard thing to decide yeah. whether my moral values are worth 10 innocent lives. So that's where I connect that. So it's just a thought. I think that's an important, that's an important perspective. Uh, that's a Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you.